Well, um, the, it depends on what one means by adaptation. If adaptation simply means a transient change in behavior, um, you know, if you and I are playing basketball and you quickly discover that I like to go right and don't like to go left, and you cheat off that side, you've adapted your behavior. Uh, that's true, by the way, I can't go left. Um, the, um, you've adapted your behavior to be in an effective way. That's not heritable change. You're not going to adapt as a species because of your change in behavior when you and I are playing one-on-one -on -one basketball. But adaptation to a biologist is somewhat different. When you talk about adaptation, you're really talking about something that's genetic, which is a genetic change in a species, a heritable change from one generation to the next. In order to have such heritable changes, in order to bring novel genetic information into play, you need mutations. And in fact, under certain circumstances, there, there, there are many examples of bacteria and eukaryotic organisms like yeast that when they are placed under stress, whether it's oxygen stress, heat stress, or nutritional stress, they will actually rev up their mutation rates. They will start making more mistakes in DNA replication, and this helps them to produce greater diversity, greater metabolic diversity, and gives the species as a whole a better chance of survival. Yeah, but those, but those are heritable changes. And Cliff Taven at Harvard has now worked out the exact genes that are responsible for the changes in beak shape, beak, beak shape, easy for me to say, in Darwin's fishes. And these do involve mutational changes in transcription factors that affect gene expression in a permanent way. So I'm not quite sure what you're driving at. Are there changes that, that drive adaptation that don't always involve mutation? Well, sure they do. But, but here's you know, the broader question that I think you pr probably want to consider as someone who wants to examine evolution seriously. And that is, is the mechanism of mutational and genetic change ever capable of producing something genuinely new that didn't pre-exist in a population that is absolutely vital for its adaptation? And the answer to that is, you betcha it is. And I give you one very current example from research that was published this year, done in the laboratory of Richard Lenski at Michigan State University. Lenski, for 20 years, has maintained, I think it's either 10 or 12, parallel cultures of the common bacterium E. coli. He grows them under low, pardon? It's 12. Oh, it's 12, thanks very much, appreciate it. Um, he, grows them, he grows them under um, minimal, uh, minimal nutritional uh, conditions and recultures them every day, no contamination, very careful, and just let them do whatever they're gonna do. What happened about a year and a half ago is he decided to take a couple of these cultures and they're still being starved for basic nutrition, but he decided to put citric acid in there, citrate. A distinguishing characteristic of E. coli, it's one way that a microbiologist can tell if it really is E. coli, is it cannot grow on citrate. It cannot use citrate as a carbon source. He put a little bit in there just to tease them. All of a sudden, one of the cultures just took off and started to grow like crazy. When he analyzed it, he discovered it was metabolizing citrate. It had evolved an entirely new didn't pre-exist novel biochemical pathway that enabled it to break down and get energy from this particular compound. Since not being able to grow on citrate is a defining characteristic of this species, and now he has a species that does grow on citrate, he has a new species with a novel biochemical pathway, all produced by ordinary genetic mechanisms, ensured by evolution.